again, I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, today for this webinar where we're going to be looking at a variety of acronyms uh, that carriers can use to battle OTTs. As I look at this uh, welcome screen here, it looks like it's a, an acronym webinar, but actually there are some technologies behind these acronyms that we will be diving into today. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Dan Meyer, uh, Editor-in-Chief here of RCR Wireless News, and I'll be moderating uh, the webinar today. Uh, also joining me today on this webinar will be uh, Michael Thielander, who's the uh, President and Founder of the Signals Research Group, uh, Koba Smith, who's the Head of Voice and Messaging uh, at uh, Deutsche Telekom, and Ashu Bermani, who's the VP of Products and Go-to-Market for Digital Services at Converse. Uh, here's a quick little uh, slide just about the RCR wireless news in case for those of you who don't, uh, don't know about RCR. We've been uh, curbing the wireless technology space here for a little over 30 years, uh, specifically focused mostly on the U.S., but also some international coverage as well. So uh, just a quick little uh, information there about RCR wireless news. All right. So uh, today's uh, webinar is actually going to be touching on some uh, information that uh, I put together in a re recent story looking at uh, how operators can use some new technologies like RCS, uh, WebRTC, Volt, and, and Voice over Wi-Fi uh, to both improve services and also uh, to offer, uh, I guess, competitive uh, uh, offerings to, uh, to battle OTTs, or over the top players, which has become a pretty hot topic over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, you can actually get a copy of this uh, report on the rcrwireless.com site. It should be up there, I believe, now. So feel free to go there after the webinar to, uh, download, the, uh, to download the report there. Um, all right. Uh, so this, uh, actually, let me, before you go to that one there, uh, just let everybody know, so this one-hour webinar, uh, we're going to cover quite a few topics here. Like I said, we'll have the guests come on a little bit to provide their insights. Let's start off with, I guess, uh, I'll give a quick overview of kind of some of the findings I, I had from the, uh, from the story looking on the topic here. So uh, one of the things that uh, was brought up, you know, as obviously when operators are looking to uh, roll out some new technologies, uh, they're using, uh, you know, obviously to uh, uh, improve services. Uh, operators are spending uh, billions of dollars, as most people know, uh, on, on building out their networks, on improving their networks uh, on CapEx to, uh, to support the increased uh, data demand uh, being put on by consumers. Uh, operators are also spending lots of money on, on Spectrum to bolster those services as well. Uh, at least here in the U.S., a uh, recent Spectrum auction generated more than uh, $41 billion in revenues, uh, just showing the, uh, the, the, the importance that operators are placing on, on Spectrum uh, and using to, to improve their network uh, services. So that's uh, a little overview there on the, the need for that. Uh, obviously, this is also being uh, the OTT threat is, is a pretty, a pretty uh, big topic as well uh, when it comes to operators trying to uh, maintain control of customers and revenues. Uh, according to a Juniper research, um, the OTT challengers have cost uh, communication providers an estimated $14 billion in lost text messaging and voice revenues uh, last year alone. Uh, carriers, uh, in doing this story, I noticed that carriers that I talked to were also somewhat mixed in how they viewed uh, OTT players, uh, some were a little bit dismissive, I guess at least publicly when it comes to the threat from OTT players, while other operators were a little more open to the fact that, yeah, OTT players were uh, obviously uh, pressuring their services and, and, and kind of forcing operators to be a little more creative in, the, in their service offerings. Uh, some operators have actually even partnered with OTT players uh, to uh, tap certain markets, uh, kind of looking back on Verizon a few years ago, uh, partnered with Skype uh, for, a, uh, for a voice partnership at one point too, so obviously there are some partnerships happening in, in that space as well. Uh, one of the technologies uh, that we were talking about a lot was that was Volte, which is uh, Voice over LTE, which is uh, the ability to uh, to migrate uh, voice traffic over an LTE data network, tapping into the, the IP uh, flat uh, ecosystem there. Um, for operators, uh, being able to move towards Volte is, is a, a way for them to start migrating that 2G and 3G traffic uh, to their data networks, which will then allow them to uh, free up their uh, their 2G and 3G spectrum holdings to support Volt or to support the LTE networks, uh, which both uh, lets them uh, might, uh, mitigate the, the spectrum crunch a lot of uh, operators are feeling. Uh, analysts have noted in the past that carriers could achieve a significant uh, spectral efficiency savings in running their voice uh, traffic over their LTE networks compared to legacy systems. So obviously it's a, it's a big uh, savings for operators to, to move that way. Uh, and also moving towards, uh, towards Volte allows operators to, to, uh, to tap into IP enhancements. Uh, including video calling and to an extent HD voice, though uh, some operators have rolled out uh, HD voice over their legacy uh, uh, systems as well. But uh, that, that makes it a lot easier for operators to, to offer more enhanced services when they go to, uh, to a Volte platform. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, Volte is being rolled out by a number of operators. Uh, Verizon, AT&T Wireless, or AT&T Mobility, and uh, MT-Mobile are both rolling out Volte services commercially. Uh, Sprint is also starting to work on, on Volte here. Uh, internationally, carriers 
in Asia have been doing quite a bit with Volte. I know uh, Michael Thielander, who we'll talk with a little bit later, has done some testing on some of those networks there in South Korea and has seen some surprising results there. So a lot of movement there. Uh, also, it's being rolled out slowly in Europe. I think we've seen some announcements actually this week from some operators looking to roll out uh, Volte in some markets in Europe. Uh, but in doing the story, I did uh, notice from some people that there's been some issues uh, with a lack of low band spectrum uh, to support Volte services. That's kind of been a, an issue in Europe where uh, most of the low band spectrum is currently still uh, being reserved for uh, legacy 3G networks, but there is uh, some government uh, uh, easement, I guess, when it comes to allowing operators to start to use some of the low band spectrum to support uh, LTE. And also there are uh, 700 megahertz auctions coming up in, in, in Europe as well that will allow uh, operators there to uh, tap into some low band spectrum for broader coverage of, uh, of Volte services. So that's a uh, theme coming, coming up as well. Uh, obviously, a lot of challenges when it comes to Volte um, that I'm that I, uh, talking to people. Uh, obviously, interoperability is still a challenge. I know here, at least in the U.S., uh, operators are working on that interoperability challenge, uh, allowing customers to make calls across networks as opposed to just making Volte calls on the same network. Uh, you know, I think uh, most people have seen uh, the difference uh, when, uh, uh, for instance, text messaging was, was allowed to, to go across carrier, the significant uptake uh, in that uh, about, about 10 years ago. So uh, that will be a big part of uh, increasing usage of, of Volte. Uh, there's still challenges when it comes to the fallback to legacy systems. Uh, operators still need to kind of make sure that if a customer runs out of, a, uh, out of an LTE uh, service area that they can uh, keep their voice call uh, going even if it's over a legacy system. And obviously, quality of service is still a challenge as well. LTE is still basically looked at as a data network, and, and data sessions are definitely much different than, than a voice session. So there's still some quality of service issues that need to be worked out when it comes to, uh, to Volte services. Um, RCS, another one of the acronyms we're looking at here, uh, Rich Communication Services or, or Rich Communication Suite, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, it's been out for uh, several years now, but uh, kind of got off to a slow start, at least when it came to uh, commercial services. Uh, a lot of operators got on board with RCS, uh, but there seemed to be a, a lack of uh, broader support, which kind of slowed the, I guess, the commercial progress of, of RCS. I know uh, when we talked with, uh, with Cobus in a little bit, we'll get some more insight on, on the RCS uh, uh, deployment plans there. But, uh, but with, the, with the rise of Volte, uh, it's got, it brought a lot more attention back to RCS. I know uh, in speaking with some of the vendors, uh, you know, using RCS to support Volte uh, allows operators to provide a, a more OTT-like experience for, for their customers. So. Uh, that's a big part of kind of using those two technologies together to provide a better service for uh, for customers, and obviously it can also enhance uh, LMS deployments as well. Uh, another technology we're looking at here uh, in the report was uh, WebRTC, uh, which is seen as a way to extend uh, communication services to non-voice or maybe non-traditional devices. Um, it was kind of talked about a lot as being able to you know use like a perhaps a, like a, for instance a, a tablet device that might, maybe doesn't have uh, a voice uh, embedded into it, a voice service embedded into the device. Uh, but it can still access voice services over that device using WebRTC. Uh, Juniper Research noted that the uh, that technology is obviously a, a way to, to embed into websites, which makes it uh, an interesting option for mobile operators who want to expand their service reach uh, as they battle OTTs as well. So a lot of potential there for WebRTC uh, going forward. Uh, I know uh, Converse had a, a white paper on the topic, and some of the uh, revenue generating use cases they, they mentioned uh, included uh, number privacy, uh, the use of virtual phones, uh, again, tapping into non-traditional devices, and uh, integration with the uh, Internet of Things. So uh, a lot of potential there with WebRTC uh, for, for telecom operators. Uh, let's see here. Uh, voice over Wi-Fi. Uh, this is kind of a somewhat of a new uh, move, I guess. Obviously, Wi-Fi is being used quite a bit by operators to offload uh, data traffic, but uh, now the move is being used to, to, to obviously offload uh, some, some voice traffic as well or to tap into the, the IP uh, a structure of, of Wi-Fi to, 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 to transmit voice services. So uh, that's being tapped into by some operators. Obviously, mixed support from operators. I know uh, there's some QoS challenges. Uh, I talked with AT&T here about the, the use of voice over Wi-Fi, and they'd mentioned that uh, you know for, for uh, a use on a customer's home Wi-Fi network, uh, usually they could be a, get a pretty good service quality. But when it came to a public Wi-Fi, uh, there was really no uh, way to generate or to, to, to have a good quality of service, or at least a guarantee a quality of service. Uh, so that's kind of a, still a stepping, uh, I guess, a hurdle for, for operators when they look to, uh, to voice over Wi-Fi in, in a broader sense. Uh, a lot of device makers are getting on board with voice over Wi-Fi, uh, embedding support for it uh, into, the, into their devices. That's helping a lot with uh, consumer uh, recognition uh, for, for the service. And a lot of MVNOs, MVNOs here domestically in the U.S. Uh, and a lot of markets overseas are also tapping into voice over Wi-Fi as a way to uh, 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 transmit their voice traffic and not rely so much on, on carrier partnerships. So 
uh, a lot of support for us over Wi-Fi. Still some challenges ahead, but uh, it looks like it's a growing market there, there as well. So, um, oh, and then one final one, obviously, that we've touched on a bit in the report is uh, the Apple conundrum, as I like to call it. But uh, Apple obviously has a big uh, share when it comes to the smartphones out there. Uh, but as everybody knows, there's a, a somewhat of a closed ecosystem when it comes to Apple um, and, and their support for some of these technologies. Uh, over the past few months, they have uh, seemed to be opening up more to, towards uh, these new technologies, so that seems to be changing. I know some of the operators I talked with for the story mentioned that uh, they were seeing much broader support from Apple and expect uh, even more support uh, going forward over the next couple of months. So we should see perhaps this uh, issue with Apple perhaps uh, uh, lessen going forward. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out, but Apple is obviously a big part of this ecosystem challenge for, for the rollout of these technologies. So uh, I think that was most of my part. Yes, again, that's uh, a quick overview of some of the topics we cover in this uh, report that, that, again, you could uh, you can download from the RCR wireless.com site uh, after the webinar is over. So uh, with that, I want to now bring on the real experts to talk a bit about the, the topics here. And we want to start with uh, bringing on Michael Thielander, who's the, uh, like I said, the founder and president of Signals Research Group to get a bit of insight on the topic of Volte. I know, Michael, you've done quite a bit of uh, work uh, looking at Volte deployments and so hoping to tap into some of your expertise on what you've seen in the market there. So thanks for joining us today. We, we appreciate it. Sure, Dan. Thanks much. So I guess to set the background, we've been doing a lot of work on Volte really now going back over a year now uh, when AT&T first launched uh, their Volte services uh, last June, last July. We've done three and pretty soon four studies looking at various aspects of Volte, including uh, field testing, looking at individual device performance. We did a study looking at IR94 video, which is basically the complement uh, to, uh, to video, um, very similar to what you get with Skype and FaceTime, but it's more of an operator-based service. And then lastly, we're actually now in the process of wrapping up a report looking at uh, voice over Wi-Fi um, and how that kind of compares and contrasts to some of the over-the-top over applications, looking at interoperability uh, with the operators, uh, macro network, et cetera. So with all that in mind, I put together a few slides to kind of talk about why we need Volte and then, of course, why it's taking so long to get deployed. All right. Can you go to the next slide, Dan? Right there. All right. So if you look at basically identified, you know, four reasons why, why I believe that uh, Volte is very important. On this slide, talk about two of them, one being voice quality, the other being the impact on the network. And I think of all the, the four that we've identified, probably voice quality is probably the least important, if you really think about it. Um, what we've done is testing out in the field, looking at the quality of the voice call and how that compares to over-the-top applications as well as how that compares to 3G circuit switch voice. So MOS is the mean opinion score, and basically that's a scientific means of quantifying the quality of the voice experience. It ranges from a scale of essentially zero uh, to five. Once you get above four, that's about as good as it can get on any uh, wireless network. So if you look at Volte, you know, in the testing that we've done on, on two of the operators' networks, in the U.S. It's very consistent, kind of in the high threes to low fours in terms of a score. Then, and again, that's just about as good as it gets. Now, if you compare that to over-the-top applications, interestingly, an application like Skype or FaceTime can quite often do better uh, than Volte. Uh, the challenge is that's only true when there's not any traffic on the network. Once you start looking at loading, you look at uh, you know, having a network that's very loaded in a ballpark, just driving down the freeway. You look at some of these over-the-top applications running on top of Wi-Fi, and things can fall apart very quickly. And we've seen calls completely drop um, or basically lose all voice, uh, voice activity completely due to other activity taking place on the network. And that's because Volte uses a quality of service bearer. It gives a priority over all other traffic. An application like Skype or FaceTime, it's best effort. So you get what you get. Um, so it works fine when there's nobody else on the network or the network is like lightly loaded. Once you start seeing traffic, you know, things then fall apart. Now if you compare Volte to 3G circuit switch voice, here again it really depends. Now in the US you've got two operators that have offered HD voice on their 3G network, that being T-Mobile and Sprint. 
if you compare the two, um, there's still a difference, but it's not necessarily as significant as it is with an operator that has not done HD voice. And so it's about it's about a full point difference on a MOS score um, between 3G circuit switch voice, where it's narrow band, and Volte. That's pretty measurable, and it's pretty meaningful, and you can notice it. If you compare it to an HD voice on a 3G network, it's about a half a point better on a MOS score. So that's something that you would probably notice, um, but it's not necessarily significant. Turning to network resources, now I know that's another big area, and Dan touched on this a little bit, you know, where Volte really shines. If you compare Volte to over-the-top applications, Again, it depends on the over-the-top application you're looking at, but there can be up to a 10x difference in bandwidth requirements. Um, and I've identified several of the reasons behind that there, looking at scheduling grants and how many resource blocks you're using. Um, but by and large, what this is telling us is that is Volte is far more efficient uh, than an over-the-top application. If you compare it to 3G circuit switch voice, again, it's kind of apples and oranges because you're talking about about two different networks. Um, but the advantage here is, first of all, as Dan mentioned, about a 40% improvement in spectral efficiency. But I think more importantly, what Volte allows you to do is eventually decommission your 2G or your 3G networks. I was just coming back from a uh, conference last month, actually earlier this month, at uh, the LTE World Summit uh, in Amsterdam. You know, and a lot of the operators there in Europe are actually talking about turning off you know, their 3G networks. Well, in order to do that, you know, they rather, A, rely upon GSM or they use uh, Volte on LTE. And you look at, uh, in the U.S., you know, uh, AT&T, as an example, has been talking about plans to turn off their 2G network in, I believe, 2017, 2018. Well, in order to do that, again, having Volte in place across your uh, uh, LTE network is extremely important. I think a few years ago there was a lot of talk, you know, amongst the industry about over-the-top applications competing with Volte, and I really don't see that as being the case. If you look at North America, you know, your voice call is free, you know, so if you're a consumer, you know, you have two choices when it comes to doing a call over an LTE network. You can place a Volte call, which is free, or you can do an over-the-top application like Skype and you end up paying for it based upon your data usage. So if you think about it in a cynical fashion, if I'm an operator, yes, I want to have Volte in place, but I'd actually want my consumer to use Skype because if that's the case, they're actually consuming a lot more bandwidth and they're paying me for it um, versus me giving them a free Volte call. So let's go on now to the uh, next slide here, Dan. All right, there we go. So why else do we need it? Well, battery life uh, and call setup and return time. Um, so if you look at battery life, you know, when 3G voice was first launched, you know, there was a lot of discontent regarding the uh, battery life um, across the board compared to 2G. You look at LTE, especially with Volte, and initially it was the same thing. Um, there was definitely a performance hit when it came to comparing Volte against a 3G circuit switch call. Um, however, at the same time when we did this testing, there was also a huge advantage uh, between Volte and the various over-the-top applications, about a 35 to 45 percent uh, longer battery life. Um, initially, that wasn't the case compared to 3G. We've done some more recent tests, basically looking at you know the uh, the current drain or the, the impact on the battery life with placing a Volte call versus a 3G circuit switch call, and what we're finding now is that in many cases. Volte actually improves the battery life. What I would point out, though, that it is, it is definitely vendor specific. Um, it comes down to the chipset. It comes down to where the uh, media portion of the Volte stack is implemented. I think of all of the smartphones that we have tested, I think the iPhone actually did the best in terms of having you know, a longer battery life on Volte than it did on 3G. Turning to the uh, call setup and return times, I think this whole notion of circuit switch fallback and how long it takes to place a, a call on 3G when you're falling back from LTE, I think people have talked about that for a long time. What I'd like to highlight is the, the other aspect of it, and that is you're on, you have your LTE 
the phone, you fall back to 3G, you place your, your 3G call, it's the time that it takes to get back to LTE. That to me is just as troubling. When we were doing our testing going back a year now in AT&T's network, and we were actually testing the circuit switch fallback time, the most frustrating aspect was waiting for the phone to actually return back to LTE. What frequently happens is that there's all this background traffic that takes place on your phone, applications waking up and chatting. Well, they keep doing that on 3G or LTE, and so you need a period of several seconds where that's not happening for your phone to go dormant to allow it to turn back, return back to LTE. And quite often that doesn't happen. And to me, I think that is probably just as big a challenge or as big an issue as the initial time it, it takes to, uh, to fall back to 3G to set up your call. All right. Okay, Dan? All right. So where are we? Well, so I, I think Dan probably highlighted this pretty well. Um, United States, um, definitely uh, T-Mobile has this nationwide network. It's also doing HD voice on 3G. Verizon has done a nationwide uh, Volte service. The challenge for them is that they don't support enhanced uh, a single radio uh, frequency, or enhanced SRVCC. I'm drawing a blank here on the, uh, on the uh, acronym there. But essentially, but they can't do the voice call continuity to fall back to their uh, 3G network. That presents a challenge for them. AT&T is very slowly but surely rolling out uh, their Volte network. Um, but they also have a lot of devices. They don't necessarily advertise it, um, but if you look at their website and kind of do some digging, you'll find a large number of devices that support Volte. You know, Sprint, uh, they're basically nowhere. They've got a lot of issues to deal with and other aspects of their network before they get Volte in place. And then, you know, kind of the regional tier three operators, it's coming slowly but surely. You look elsewhere in the world and it's a you know, slightly different story. You look at Develop Asia, um, it's been there for quite a while now, you know, Korea for the last couple of years. I think Singapore is one of the first countries where Volte launched. Again, these are, are small countries, you know, it's fairly dense networks. It's fairly easy to roll out a, uh, a voice service on LTE. You compare that to uh, other regions of the world, in particular Europe, and Dan talked about this. You know, it's almost exclusively trials at the moment. I think there's a couple of operators you know, smaller operators, you know, not necessarily that the major operators that you think of that claim to have launched Volte, um, but it's really the early days, I think, across the board. Rogers Wireless, I know in Canada, has also launched Volte services, but it's, it's, it's definitely slow in coming, and on the last slide, Dan, we'll turn to talk about some of the reasons why this is the case. Well, there's technical challenges, and there's also limited LTE network rollouts. If you talk to any of the operators out there, and this includes operators especially that are trialing LTE as well as or Volte, as well as operators that have actually launched Volte, one reason across the board is IMS. You know, and there's just different ways of implementing IMS. You know, different chipset suppliers do it differently. Handset manufacturers with that chipset tend to do their own IMS stack. That poses challenges as well. On the infrastructure side, you also have different implementations. You put this all together, so operator A tries to figure it out one way, operator B does it a different way. Um, it works in their network, but now you try to do interoperability across those networks. That is definitely a challenge. The other important thing is densification, and Dan mentioned this as well, um, but you know, when, when LTE networks were first launched, it was all about doing a basic you know, data service, best effort. You didn't care about real-time uh, voice calls. You didn't necessarily care about handovers. If something happened during a handover, the consumer never knew about it. Now you try to do a real-time voice call, and that can be problematic. And I know in the testing that we've done, you know, we've definitely seen that where, you know, the LTE network was great for a best effort data call, but when it came to doing something like Volte, there was definitely some issues there. Now we talk about roaming, you know, I think there's also the other aspect of there's both the uh, cross-operator calling support, but also longer-term Volte roaming is something that needs to take place. One of the challenges right now is that operators aren't necessarily in agreement of how best to do that. You know, some operators want to do local breakout, some want to do home routing. Um, even the operators in the U.S. 
until till at least recently were not in agreement on how to do that. I think ultimately I believe the operators have generally come to an agreement on how to do Volte roaming. The challenge there is that I think it's going to take some changes to the standards to really make that a reality. And then obviously there's also the, the uh, device compatibility, you know, making sure that your device that you have in one network actually supports that same frequency band in another network. And we have a lot of devices today that support four, five, six, seven LTE frequency bands. It's now just a matter of making sure that Volte has been deployed in all of those bands across all of the operators. And then lastly, you know, voice over Wi-Fi, um, that's definitely something that is out there today. There's no reason why you can't have interoperability across operator networks there. The challenge, number one, is going to be IMS uh, and making sure that all works together. There's challenges today within one operator's network trying to do voice over Wi-Fi. Extending that to a couple of operators just kind of complicates matters. And then with IR94 video, you know, Verizon, as an example, has launched, you know, that video chat service in their network. I don't think operators are necessarily all that excited about IR94 video as they are with respect to Volte. So I think that's going to remain a niche application. And I'm not necessarily convinced that operators will actually push for having interoperability of their IR94 videos across networks. So with that, Dan, I'll turn it back to you. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. And again, for those uh, who, who are listening in here, if you ever need some very in-depth technical aspects or, or research on any of these topics, uh, uh, Signals and Mike, they do very in-depth uh, stuff. And obviously, when I, I talk to Mike quite a bit, and whenever I do, I'm always learning something and or being confused by something. So uh, lots of in-depth uh, insight there. But Mike, we definitely appreciate uh, all that good information there uh, as well. So with that, Mike, thanks, thanks again for that insight there. Uh, let's move on to uh, get a carrier's perspective now on some of these technologies. And with that, we're going to bring on Kobus Smith, who's the head of voice and messaging uh, for Deutsche Telekom. And Kobus is joining us uh, late evening there from Germany. Uh, Kobus, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. That's no problem, Dan. It's also not that late, considering that I was up at 2.30 this morning talking to people in China. So this is actually quite a convenient time. Um, <laughs> this is not about me complaining. So Yeah, so hoping Absolutely. to get, I guess, you know, obviously with Mike there, we touched quite a bit on the Volte and the voice of a Wi-Fi topic. I guess hoping with you to get some insight, uh, perhaps more on the RCS and maybe even WebRTC topics. So uh, maybe get, I guess, your general view of, you know, uh, how operators view these technologies and how, I guess, how DT perhaps views the use of RCS and maybe even R uh, WebRTC in their overall, uh, uh, I guess, strategy when it comes to both enhancing their own voice services and their own, their own operations, but also and making sure that, you know, again, the battle with OTT, that's kind of an underlying current as well, but how you guys, you know, use your, use these technologies to, to, to go after those services as well. So maybe a general overview on how you view perhaps even, uh, I guess, start with RCS. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly broad range of things that you're asking me about, so I will talk for a little while. Stop me if I start rambling and start boring um, or everyone on the call. Um, I'm going to start with the, um, the, the big picture, trying to figure out where communication is going. This is quite relevant for us because we, conveniently for you guys, just had a um, deep dive uh, discussion with our board, our XCOM uh, for, for the group about the future of communication and um, I can share with you the outcome of that is basically um, that we are targeting standardized communication services, so standardized almost traditional operator communication services and the evolution of those um, for our core communication service providing to our customers and we will complement that with some experimentation in, in more innovative of different different forms where WebRTC certainly plays a role. I will come. I will circle back to this in a minute to to put some more perspective onto it. The key message is that we still believe that the core communication services are provided um, best in the way that operators can do it best, which is an interconnected service offering between operators that provide customers a, a seamless experience end to end. Um, we also have learned quite painfully to, um, on some occasions, that the best way to do this is not to try to introduce something new to our customers, which is something that we have tried to do under the brand Join, which some of you might uh, might know, might have, might have um, encountered um, when we launched RCS a couple of years ago. We, we, we positioned the RCS services as something new 
Um, and the customer perception of that was that it's an app or that it's comparable to an OTT service um, and that it's not building on all the benefits of the stuff that operators offer. Even though we were trying to do that, the customer perception was different and that's not something you can easily change. So what we've learned is that we should be focusing on the stuff that we're strong at. The stuff that we're strong at is ubiquity, providing services to everyone everywhere. That's what you have at the moment, voice and SMS. There's no other messaging service in the world, despite how big any OTT is at the moment, that you can use to reach absolutely everyone with a mobile phone. SMS is the only way. It's that blanket ubiquity. That's a massive advantage that operators can offer. So what we're going to do, or what we are doing already, and successfully so, is building on that in how we um, evolve our services. So let's circle around to the technology which you were asking about, Dan. So what we're doing with RCS is um, we've been in this game for quite a while. We've been one of the one of the most um, or one of the ones pulling it, um, if I might put it like that and promoting the services together with um, Vodafone, um, Orange, uh, Telecom Italia in the early days, and um, since more recently AT&T, um, China Mobile, um, the Korean operators. So it's really spreading significantly from the early days where it was really hard and really trying to convince people. We now have reached a, an acceptance level for RCS, which is, um, which is really high. We've got all of the world's largest operator groups um, effectively either having deployed it or engaging in employing it, deploying it. We have it natively embedded on all handsets at the moment. So we're shipping in Germany every handset other than Apple, and I know we're going to circle back to the <laughs> Apple conundrum later, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. We'll address it then. But every other handset that leaves, um, that is being shipped in Germany at the moment is a native, um, natively enabled RCS handset. That's really important. We've got over 80 handsets in the market already supporting um, RCS natively. And why native is important is um, we have seen that the penetration of the service that we can achieve with native implementation on handsets is, is cannot be rivaled by anything else. You don't have to convince someone to download something. You can just present a service evolution, a better service experience to your customer under the buttons that they've always pressed. So the voice button is getting better by putting Bolte under it. Um, and the RCS or the messaging button is getting better by put, putting RCS under it. And that's been a very, very important change to what we've done before. So as of Blackbird, so I'm going to throw another acronym in there, or another <laughs> name. Blackbird is the current version of RCS that we've deployed. That has brought a very important innovation, which is integrated messaging, which has allowed us to give customers a completely integrated experience between um, RCS and SMS. So that means if A party and B party are both RCS enabled, so both of the devices can do it, then the experience automatically goes to chat um, with the benefits of that, ease typing, um, read receipts, uh, inserting pictures, going to group chat, all of these things. Those automatically appear. If the B party is not enabled, it automatically falls back to SMS. So that seamless offering is working extremely well. We've seen a 270% increase in active usage in Germany in the, in the three months since, in, um, since starting to ship these devices uh, natively um, in Germany. And it's really taking off. And it's really, really, really heartwarming for us to see that it is really taking off. Customers appreciate it, and they are using it. So that, that's, a, that's really a breakthrough for us, because up until now, we've been running on belief which is really difficult. It's always difficult to explain that to your board members and also difficult to explain it, especially to controllers, that they should keep giving you money because you believe that you're doing the right thing. Now we can prove that we're doing the right thing. So that's a, a very much more comfortable position to be in. So RCS is there. It's working, and we can prove that it's working. And we've got all of the major operators um, onto it or get coming onto it. We've got all of them device manufacturers supporting it. So we've got finally got the ecosystem in place and now it's starting to pay off. So let's go on to the second one is Volte. We believe Volte is really important for us. Um, I, I, I very much like the presentation that we just had um, and I share a lot of the things that were said in there but for me as a product um, and marketing guy the most important thing to realize that Volte is primarily in my mind at least not a customer proposition. Volte is a technology um, evolution. It's really important for us. It is how we go into um, IP voice um, as an as an industry, um, 
but it's not primarily a customer proposition. The customer pre benefits on two things with Volte. He gets faster setup times. He gets arguably better better voice quality um, on, on HD voice, which you can also achieve on circuit switch if you, if you implemented that. So yes, those are important things, but those are not going to be the deal breakers or the ones that win the war. What we believe will win it is to keep evolving our, our voice experience. Similar to what we're doing with RCS, we're now in, um, introducing um, enhanced calling, which is a feature set that we have developed based on RCS together with Vodafone and Sony and Samsung and Orange. And we'll be launching that in Germany um, to the latter, latter end of this year. What it does is it, it improves your, your, your call experience by enriching it with elements pre-call, during the call or after the call. Pre-call you can think of a use case like adding urgency and putting a small message on there so that when the B party's phone rings and he picks it up and he looks at it, there's context information on the screen and not just an incoming screen. Add a picture, all of that. Share a map during a call, draw on the map from both sides. All of these use cases um, are supported and are in there and gives customers a better calling experience. To my mind, again, as a product and marketing guy, that's exciting because that gives the customer a tangible improvement of his calling experience and Volte is something that we are, of course, doing in parallel to, to, to build, because uh, that's our production. We're changing the engine of our car. Um, but in front of the customer, enhanced calling will, be, will have a bigger impact, I believe. WebRTC, um, that's got a role. It's most definitely, it's a very exciting technology. It enables things that weren't possible before. It makes life a lot simpler in certain um, instances. We currently believe that WebRTC has a lot of potential but it's not yet ripe or in any way um, ready to be deployed and used as a primary communication means. So we make this distinction, maybe a fairly um, theoretical distinction between primary communication, secondary communication. Primary communication is easiest defined as I'm, I want to talk to someone or I want to communicate with someone. The primary purpose of what I'm doing is to establish communication. We believe there operators are best served with standardized services and the evolution of that which is what we're driving through RCS and Volte and voice over Wi-Fi. Um, secondary communication, however, something that you do by the way. You're busy with something else primarily, and you want to do something, in you want to talk in combination to that, or you want to chat in combination with that. So, for example, you're sitting behind your PC, you're playing a game, and you want to have a chat session going in parallel. Then, alternative technologies arguably have a better, can better be deployed. So that's how, that's how we see the interplay between these things. Um, and we are experimenting in this space and we are, of course, looking at what can be done here. It's an exciting area for us, but it's not where we see the main thrust. The main thrust that we see is still on, on the standardized area for all of the reasons that I mentioned before. It's what operators are good at. Um, secondary communication services, we will be exploring um, WebRTC um, and other technologies as, as appropriate. So that's definitely not a no-go. It's an exciting space, um, but we don't see it as our primary offering. Voice over Wi-Fi, um, that to me is a no-brainer almost because, again, because of the customer value it brings. It brings very clear customer value in terms of um, reach extension, so especially in-house coverage. Now, we always like to brag, and in Germany, of course, we don't need that because we've got the best network. Um, but in some of our other countries, maybe that's not the case. No, no, seriously, all of us, we have some some, uh, some coverage issues in-house, deep in-house. You go into your cellar, you might have Wi-Fi there, but you're not going to have the good um, um, cellular coverage. So that's what Voice over Wi-Fi gives you. It gives customers the possibility to extend these features in-house to it themselves and give them um, this reach. So for me, that's a no-brainer. It's something that we um, are doing, and it's not... It, it just gives customers another way of reaching our services, so why would we not do that? Um, there's a second proposition in there, which is roam like at home uh, for a customer if you're on Wi-Fi, and you can then just arguably um, call from your cook dining plans that you have at home. For me, as a customer, <laughs> as, a, as a product guy, again, that's a wonderful proposition. I know that my roaming colleagues um, have some more trouble with that, so there might be some issues to, to sort out before we actually roll that out in a big way to customers. But that's an exciting space as well. So I've, I've rattled through um, the technologies that we're using. We're using all four of these technologies that are on the slide. To recap um, for us, um, Volte is a, is, is a have to do 
Um, RCS, we believe, gives us a lot of um, opportunity to really enrich the services, both voice and messaging. Um, voice over Wi-Fi for us is a no-brainer because um, because of the value it gives to um, to our customers. Um, WebRTC will be experimenting in and building niche or specific solutions around um, that complement the others. Uh, one last thought, video uh, was mentioned in the last presentation. Um, I believe yep. in video. I think video will at some point be really, really big because to my mind it approaches natural communication. What we're doing now at this time on this webinar is not natural human communication. This is voice and the reason we're doing voice is because the technology allows it. If video was available and seamless and, and high quality and perfect, we would have done video. I'm absolutely convinced in that. If we had holograms available and perfectly, we would have done that. <laughs> so my point there is not about fantasizing about the future, but my point is that we will always custom people will always use the communication medium that approaches natural communication and the best natural communication is when you're face to face with someone you can see his body movements you can understand a lot more in the communication than that voice what what voice only carries carries and that's why i firmly believe that it will be there it will take up um, and it's just a matter of getting all the bits and pieces in a row and the technology is getting better all the time so at some point it will come I'm not sure exactly when and exactly how and which way by shape or form, but at some point it will come. So that's why we will actively go after this. Um, I share the thought mentioned before that IR94 might not be the thing that gets us there. For me, the skepticism about IR94 is that initially it's not the service that you can easily launch and produce in your market while you're still rolling out your voltage services because it limits... Um, at least in the way it, it, it exists today, it, it relies on an A party and a B party both having a capable device and both staying in LTE coverage for the duration of the call. Otherwise, the video will drop and the call will fall back, thanks to something called SLVCC, will fall back um, to audio. But that's not really a great customer proposition because what your proposition to the customer will be if you don't already have full blanket coverage of LTE, your proposition will then to the customer be, dear customer, you can make a video call with us sometimes and it might drop. That's not a great proposition. So what we are pursuing is the um, RCS IP video um, because it utilizes exactly the same technology. It's almost a carbon copy of the IR94. Um, so it, that also means that in future it will be available for us to do upgrades, downgrades to, to IR94. And that for us is a, is, an, is a path into video. So that's something that we will explore. Um, I'm not, I don't think it's going to be overnight success, but at some point it's going to be big. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, great. Well, uh, well, I def definitely appreciate the great insight on all those topics. Obviously, you guys are doing quite a bit in terms of all these technologies. It's good to hear uh, from the carriers kind of how you view all these things. So we definitely appreciate that. And again, some of those issues you brought up too, I think we will try to tackle some of those here at the end here if we get some time for Q&A. Um, obviously, a lot of still a lot, a lot of big challenges still ahead of us on those. But, but before we get too much farther, I want to make sure we bring on our final member of the panel here. Let me uh, get through our uh, the slides here. Uh, here we go. Yeah. So, uh, with the vendor perspective, we're now going to bring on uh, Ashu Romani, who's the uh, VP of Products and Go to Market uh, for Digital Services at Converse. Uh, Ashu, thanks for joining us. I know uh, you guys are doing a lot of work in terms of all these technologies, actually. Uh, looking and talking to you guys, it's been amazing to see, you know, you guys aren't just uh, limiting yourselves to just one or two of these things. You guys are doing quite a bit of work on all these things. So uh, perhaps to get some insight from you here really quickly on kind of what you guys are doing in, in terms of, uh, of these spaces. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, if you would, uh, you know, forward over to maybe one more chart. Perfect. Uh, sure. so, so very quickly, let me put this all in perspective and, and how we view things. Um, uh, and, and, and why we think all of these technologies do help the carriers in, in what, what is the title of this webinar is, is to, to, to shape their, their battle, if you will, if you were to call it that. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side graph of this, I mean, these things represent 17, 18-year trends. And if you look at the voice curve and the messaging curve, uh, and then the third curve represented by data, right? Uh, if, if you think of this is the traditional, you, you know, 20 year old, 10 year old offering that is coming from uh, from the carriers. And what you see is that on the first two curves, 
the, the point on those curves is somewhat past the tipping point. You can argue that in some emerging economies, there is still a little bit of growth in those, but for the most part, those curves are past the 50% point. There is there's still gonna be around for the next 20 years, uh, except the growth in those curves is probably flat to declining now. What is interesting, and you've seen this happen in the market as well, as we all, is that now data is being sold, and I think this point was made earlier as well on, on uh, I think by Mike, that uh, you know, Volti turns out to be free, whereas an OTT turns out to be consuming data, right? So data is the curve on which the carriers are riding today. Uh, selling data and and bundling in minutes and and uh, messages right if you think about it uh, if this is the arsenal on the left hand side <clears throat> then i think the battle on the right hand side will likely go to ott what is interesting is that on the left hand side there is a fourth curve not shown here which is a set of vertically integrated use cases that will take advantage of the first three curves. It'll take advantage of, of messages and voice and, and, and data and put together what we call verticalized use cases. So, and, and these will then be offered to customers. So, so when, you, when you think about the recent partnership between Mercedes and Nest Thermostat, right? And you see where that is going. Uh, it's, it's about you know, me as a consumer driving driving home and, and if I live in suburbia, when I reach a few miles within my home, my car can message to my home and maybe turn on the porch lights, you know, turn the oven on, raise the temperature, what have you. I am beginning to get into home automation, right? When you, when you think about somebody who has a pacemaker and, and rather than have, you know, monthly visits to the doctor, you know, which takes time out of your life, uh, perhaps uh, something, you know, like a Fitbit like device that, that, that he or she wears on their wrist uh, sends a data feed, the electrocardiogram every day, which is then analyzed with some big data trends. And, and somebody else can then call in and say, hey, mister, you need to come in tomorrow because we found some anomalous behavior in your heartbeat. So what you're now doing is you're improving the quality of somebody's life. Uh, so in the end, these services or these vertical applications are using uh, all the first three curves. So the fourth wave is nothing but, but a collection of vertically integrated services. And, and according to Gartner, that market, that fourth wave market will represent 15% of the carrier top line in 2017. And, and we just did some rough math on 50 carriers in the world, the top 50. And that turns out to be about a trillion and a half market US dollars every year. And so so it, the fourth wave is, is huge, and, and many CSPs are now beginning to realize the value of selling because, you know, you can't sell more minutes. You can't sell more messages. You, you got to sell solutions that solve people's lives, uh, you, you know, solves uh, quality of life, you know, whether it's e-health, whether, whether it's connected car, um, whether it's multiplayer gaming, right? And so, so, so that's sort of the, the high level backdrop on what we are trying to do is help CSPs, you know, the C in that stands for communication, right? And then most of the CSPs uh, are, are getting boxed in as providing just communications. And, and our mission in life is helping them become DSPs or digital service providers where they are doing many things beyond just communications. So, so that's sort of the background. If you move over to, to sort of the next chart, how do we see these technologies, the four or five technologies that we have talked through, uh, helping them advance to that, right? So if you look at the very beginning, and I think, you know, Mike and Kobus really covered it very well, um, where, you know, there is this, you know, baseline ubiquity that you get with messaging and voice services. These, these, are, these guys are, these services are everywhere. They're very well connected. You can pretty much be assured that you can reach the other party provided they have a phone. And the, the next step on that is, is modernizing these technologies. So, so the messaging advances over to IP messaging. Uh, the, the 3G voice, 2G voice is advancing over to, to Volti and, and voice over Wi-Fi. In the process of modernizing, you're getting some benefits. You're getting high def quality. You're, you're getting uh, multi-device experience. Um, there's some research uh, uh, you know, from Apple that on an average, a user is now connected over uh, three and a half times more devices than the SIM based device. So if, if you look at a typical household, I can give you an example of my own household. I have about 18 or 19 devices that are IP based. 
uh, that that can be addressable via SIP or via WebRTC or any other technology between Kindles and laptops and you know tablets and IPTVs and and, and iPod touches, and yet I only have three SIM-based devices in my home. So the ratio is is actually more than three and a half to one in my household. But it's different. On an average, we as humans are living a digital life and and. And we are connected in many, I mean, Cobus was taking this webinar from an iPad. I, 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 that's what we just heard earlier, right? So, so you can tell part of making things IP enabled is also extending the reach beyond the, the SIM-based devices. And unfortunately, a lot of the carriers are, are reaching their subscribers only on SIM-based devices, which means they're missing out on a big chunk of life uh, that their subscribers daily conduct, right? Now, that, so that's step two in this chart. Is step three, these things convert into a holistic experience where there is a seamlessness between a chat, uh, between a call, between video, right? So, so because it's all IP-based, now we can layer in new services that simply were not possible on an SS7 network or a TDM network, uh, which was really the first sort of column in this chart. And, and if, you, if you add to that, the WebRC, WebRTC technology, and I, I won't dwell too much on, on RCS except that, you know, we are engaged in, in many opportunities today, and, and we see a resurgence in RCS, and partly it's happening because of the device manufacturers committing to building that thing natively. So when you open the phone, the out-of-box experience is that default dialing experience, and, and yes, from a marketing perspective, that is the experience. You're not upselling anything. You're not trying to charge your subscribers anything extra. This is what you get. Uh, and this at least brings the carrier experience to be at parity with the OTT experience at the blue box level. Now, if you add WebRTC, we, we think of WebRTC in, in two different ways, right? Number one, we think of it as a reach extension. So. And there are many use cases that are possible through what is sort of the first green box inside the gray WebRTC box. Is if you look at an RCS API gateway or if you look at a WebRTC gateway, what it can do is it can create a Chrome browser that could pretty much work on any smartphone and become a logical extension and it could become a B party uh, to, to RCS. And there, there, are, there are use cases. Uh, roaming was a good example, so let me pick on that. You know, if you think of Mobile World Congress in Barcelona and, and, and you know, 100,000 people traveling over, uh, you know, a service that Telefonica launched um, in, in, that, uh, in that market was essentially uh, you can go to a website, get a plus three, four number, which is the local country code, and, um, and, and for five bucks a day or a very small amount per day, uh, you can... Uh, you can do local calling all you can eat. Well, think about all of the traffic that a local carrier could get uh, by creating a simple WebRTC use case. There are use cases like anonymous calling or expanding the reach of a carrier outside of its geography. You could do the inverse of the use case that I just described. The, the other part that WebRTC brings to the table uh, was really adding communications to, to non-coms use case. And I think the term Cobus used here was secondary communications and that's that's exactly and we, we've used different terminology but I think we both mean the same is that when you talk about uh, you know sensor to sensor communication when you talk about multiplayer gaming and inside of that multiplayer game adding communications or if you if you think about uh, you know salesforce.com automation and and while you're looking at account review you can click a button and then call or a call center allowing people to to communicate or chat with each other now you are using webrtc as a technology to add communication but the primary use was something else right so 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 in, in a nutshell, this is sort of the progression that we see, and this is how we see the technologies helping the CSP create what I earlier described as fourth wave services, vertically integrated services that are solving some tangible problem for either a business customer or, or, or a general consumer, right? So if you go to the next chart, right? So, so far we have talked about how, right? You, you know, I'm sorry, the what, uh, you know, expanding. What this chart, describes is really the how and then the four steps we see in the journey of a CSP, a communication service provider, becoming a DSP or a digital service provider. And, and this is sort of a consolidation of all of the RFP activity, the market activity that we are seeing. Step one, almost all of the CSPs that we talk to, that we engage with are 
are, are, are basically asking us to simplify their current traditional platforms. So if you look at the, the SMS, MMS, voicemail, visual voicemail world, most CSPs have, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, they've made purchasing decisions that were independent and these things were siloed. So, so, so the first thing is, can we take those legacy platforms and can we combine those into something simple in the cloud? Uh, DT happens to be one of the examples uh, that we publicly talked about where, you know, 12 countries, not, not Germany yet, but 12 countries outside that are, that are T-Mobile properties and, and consolidating those into two clouds in, in Poland and Greece and, and allowing all of the other NATCOs to buy or, or, or uh, borrow quantity uh, of those services through those simple. So we have simplified legacy deployments. Modernize, as I said, is about expanding the reach to IP-based endpoints. So not limiting it to SIM-based devices, but SIM plus the IP-based devices, which expands the addressable market, you know, another threefold. And, and differentiation comes through doing services that are possible not in the TDM world, but now because you have IP. So when you talk about streaming from a phone to, to an IP TV, or you're talking about, you know, uh, collect messaging or, or, or sponsored messaging or sponsored data, now you're layering in new value propositions for the end user and enriching those experiences. And finally, we think it's now possible after having done the first three steps, <clears throat> is to leverage WebRTC to create these fourth wave services, as an example. In addition, using APIs to allow the CSP network to become its own iTunes. So, so you expose the network and you expose the assets that a carriers have in allowing third party developers. So, you know, in, in the fourth wave, you know, two guys in, the, in a garage could have a good, brilliant idea. Uh, and, and there are many CSPs who have tried it and tried it successfully to open up their network and monetize on a rev share basis new applications that are created on top of those networks. Right? So it's, it's a simple four step process, but I think the technologies that we talked about are helping move from left to right. Um, so in a nutshell, that's how we see these technologies and, and that's how we see the journey of a CSP uh, becoming a DSP over time. And we think it's absolutely critical that they all move forward on this journey. Let me pause here because we want to leave some time for a few questions, and I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, I think we're just yeah, no problem. No, no, no problem. That's obviously very, very interesting insight there. And yeah, look, look, look the clock here. We're about a couple minutes uh, left in the webinar here, so uh, I don't think we have a lot of time for to take a lot of questions here. But I did want to, I guess, touch quickly. I know uh, Kobus kind of brought it up, and uh, you know, obviously the 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 issue when it comes to ecosystems and Apple is, is a big part of of the ecosystem when it comes to communications uh, for a lot of a lot of customers out there. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe Kobus, I guess maybe touch quickly on, you know, I guess your view of how, how the Apple issue is being tackled and, and do you see that issue as being perhaps, uh, I guess, uh, surmounted here uh, in, in a short period of time? Sure. Um, what we're doing, as, a, as I said, we're focusing on, on the more standardized way of, of doing things. And, and to, to be fair, Apple has made quite quite a lot of progress um, in that area. Yep. They're now supporting um, IMS-based services with Volte and voice over Wi-Fi. So that has really opened the door significantly. And we, in our um, discussions um, that we're having with Apple, we are seeing a lot more uh, interest or willingness to to start uh, cooperating on operator-based services. However, Apple is still Apple, so that makes life uh, slightly, <laughs> slightly more difficult. Where where we are really making a lot more significant progress is with Android. So, and funnily enough, that yeah. will help us with Apple. It sounds contradictory, but we will have um, fully integrated IMS-based service support in Android uh, soon. Yeah. Um, that's something that we're actively working with with Android uh, at the moment, and I'm very, very confident that we'll achieve that. Um, and that will certainly help towards also achieving the same thing with Apple. I don't, I can't speak for Apple, but I, all I can say is when when we have spoken to them, there's never been a situation of go away, we don't want operator services. They already do that. They already do voice support, they're already doing and they're doing the migration towards Volte, they're doing SMS and MMS support, and I firmly believe that they will do the migration towards RCS, and they basically told us that once these services are mainstream use cases, they, would, they will not withhold those from their customers, they will integrate those. So 
I think it's a problem for us, yes, um, because of the, the wide penetration and the difficulty of, 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 of accessing um, the, the OS, which is very close and very controlled. Um, but I think it's a problem that will get solved um, in, in due course. Yeah. yeah, and obviously I know, Michael, you talked a little bit earlier, the fact that, you know, obviously it seems like Apple's products uh, seem to do pretty well when it comes to battery life with some of these services too. So uh, support there from Apple, I'm guessing, will uh, will be uh, wanted and perhaps even, even going to be uh, uh, supported pretty well from Apple at some point as well. So um, I guess we'll see how that plays out. Well, uh, well, I mean, obviously we're out of time on this. This could have been uh, obviously a two-hour webinar, but uh, I know people got uh, a lot of things to do during the daytime, but we definitely appreciate uh, everybody's input today. I want to again thank uh, our, our panel members, uh, Michael Thielander from uh, Signals Research Group, uh, Koba Smith from, from George Telecom, and Ashu Vermani from, from Converse for the great insight today. Uh, again, I apologize to all the questions that were sent in. We will be sharing these questions uh, with our panel members, though, so there could be some potential for some follow-up uh, offline with these questions. But we definitely want to thank uh, all the panel, all the uh, listeners for sending those in. Thanks for those. And again, thanks to our, our panel members for the great insight today. And again, uh, if you were looking for some more information on the topic, feel free to go to the rcrwireless.com site. You can uh, download the, the story with a lot of more insight from these, these panel members as well as others uh, on, on the topic. So feel free to go there uh, now that we're almost done and download that. Uh, and again, I want to thank everyone again for joining us today on this webinar. And uh, we'll talk uh, hopefully again soon on this topic. Uh, again, thanks everyone.